First of all, how many people here believe that we should have a limited government? They shouldn't be in every aspect of our lives. I, I want to see somebody who didn't raise their hand. One person didn't raise their hand. He wants you in every aspect of their life. Okay. Um, okay, number two. How about fiscal responsibility? They spend your money the way it should be spent. Who wants that? And how about following the Constitution of the United States of America? I'm glad you elected officials are here. Because this is we the people. And without any further ado, I would like to bring up Kayla Brown. I'm short. It's a long-running joke. Good evening. You guys are very lively. Usually they have me come up to spice up the crowd, but they don't need any spicing, Uncle Terry. Am I done? No. All right. Um, you're going to hear a lot of things tonight. You're going to hear a lot of things about water and timber and mining. You're going to hear about Supreme Court cases, and you're going to hear a lot about finances and money, and, and really it gets very tedious. So. Um, I would like to talk to you more about something that we can all much more easily relate to, and that's history. That's family. That's um, everything that we go home to every single day. Okay? So we're going to talk a little about California real quick. Before California became a state, before it was part of the United States, California was part of uh, uh, the Spanish Empire. It was owned by the Spaniards, right? Okay? So what happened in 1848 is the United States was at war with Mexico. And after we essentially beat Mexico, we got California and several other uh, territories to become part of the United States. And in 1848, the president who was um, the president of the United States of America at that time was my great, 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 great grand uncle, James Knox Polk. Okay? Pretty cool, huh? I love genealogies. It's just kind of cool. <laughs> So California then becomes part of the United States, but it's a territory, so California has a problem. Nobody wants to stay a territory. You want to be a state, because statehood means that your people have the right to do what they want to do within that specific area. So in 1849, California goes, okay, well, we want to be a state. And all of Northern California went, yes, we want to be a state. And Southern California goes, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to be a state. And they didn't want to be a state because there were a bunch of rural farmers down there at the time. They didn't have Los Angeles at, at the tune that it is today. They were the rural folk, and Northern California, because of the mines, were the city folk back then. So Southern California goes, oh, no, we don't want this. You're going to tax us out of existence. All right? So they petition Congress, and they say, please, we'll be the territory of Colorado. Don't make us part of a state with those crazy Northern Californians. And Congress goes, eh, no, you're going to be one state. So in 1850, California is admitted to the Union as a single state. Okay? Didn't take too long before California realized it's a little big. It's just, you know, it's about the size of, what, 11 East Coast states? So it's, it's a little big. And so the Californians in the assembly in 1852, two years after statehood, they go, you know, maybe we should, you know, cut this up a little bit. It's kind of big. Did you know that? It's big. And they do that for about two years, and, and they propose three states. The northernmost state was called the state of Shasta, which today we propose as the state of Jefferson. And that was in 1852 to 1854. Passes the assembly, Senate doesn't take it up, so it, it's dead in the water. By 1859, Southern California goes, you guys are taxing us to death. You're taxing us to death. This is ridiculous. We're out. And you know what? The PICO Act passed the Assembly, it passed the Senate, and it went to Congress back in D.C. Southern California was almost its own state, but there was a war going on back east. Okay? They had the Civil War, so Congress didn't even take it up. So California stayed as one state. It came back again in the 1880s. It came back in the early 1900s, the 1920s. You see in the pattern here? Every single generation has realized there's something wrong with California. In 1941, we have the State of Jefferson movement where we get the moniker State of Jefferson. And in 1941, Northern California and Southern Oregon worked together to almost become the 51st state. Actually, it would have been like the actual 49th state at the time, but that's semantics. 
But what happened? World War II. The people of Northern California put on hold their wants and their wishes for the betterment of America to go fight a war together with the rest of California. In 1960s, State of Jefferson came back up. In 1992, State of Jefferson came back up with Stan Statham's um, multi-state deal. Here in Tehama County, you guys voted overwhelmingly in support of separating, of creating multiple states. But we, we won that, and then we went home. Why did we go home? We could have had multiple states in 1992, but here we are again today, another generation saying, California is ungovernable. But today, it's the rural folks of Northern California looking at Southern California sittings and going, you're taxing us to death. You see the cycle here. And the reason why this is most important is, raise your hand if you were born and raised here in the North State. That's quite a few hands. How many of you had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren here in the North State? How many of them are still here? Quite a few. That's excellent. Most of the time, you get a lot of hands and a lot of people saying, my children and my grand grandchildren and my grandchildren, they are not here. And they're not here because there aren't jobs. There's not an economy here. You can't support young people here. And the reason why this really hits home with somebody like me is because I'm 24 years old. I'm currently in a master's program. When I graduated from Chico State, I had a 3.5 GPA, couldn't get a job in Northern California, couldn't get a job in California, couldn't get a job in the United States of America, so I went to Russia. <laughs> I got a job in Russia. I got to use my Russian language skills, but I wanted to work in the United States. And that's the, that's the crux of the issue, is, is when we grow up, we're always told that if you go and get a good education, you'll get a good job and you can actually survive. Do you believe that in Northern California? Do you think it's going to get better under the state of California? I don't think so either. Do you think it'll be better if we create a state of Jefferson so our young people can survive? There you go. Boy, that was pithy. Very pithy. You know, it's interesting when you stop and think about the fact that a lot of people have had to leave California, a lot of our kids have had to leave and haven't come back because they couldn't find work. Economically, we're in a world of hurt. And as you all know, and I'm going to ask you a question I asked Jim Nielsen. I said, Jim, I said, name one law, one law that you guys pass out of the eight you pass a day when you're in session that doesn't make the law-abiding citizen of the state of California a criminal? Yeah, same response, nothing. In every crowd we've talked to, in every county, in every city, it's the same response. The state of California has put us in a position to where they're squeezing out law-abiding citizens. How do you like AB 109? Huh? How do you like the bathroom law? These are the things that the state of Jefferson can change. And now, Robert Smith. Evening, everybody. Quite a crowd. Happy to see this many people. A lot of the questions are, is can we do this and why are we doing this? Well why we're doing this, you could pick a laundry list of reasons. Is it over gun rights? Is it over, is it over um, the ability to work here? Is it over the, the economy? Is it over water? Is it because we can't manage our own resources? Um, what it really comes down to is representation, is we are not represented here in the North State. And it's not our representatives' fault. It's not our elected officials' fault. They are in the ring. They are swinging for us. They're doing the best they can. The problem is, is depending on how you look at the map of how Jefferson will shake out, you, we have three or five representatives, okay? All of us, a third of the state, we have five representatives that are doing their best to represent us. The city of Los Angeles, or the county of Los Angeles, has 35 representatives. You know, we, we had a conversation with Doug Lamalfa, and he put it pretty well, and he said when they were taking roll call back when he was in the state assembly, they asked for the representative in the Butte area to stand up and Doug Lamalfa stood up. They asked for the, county of, the representatives from the County of Los Angeles to stand up, and a third of the state assembly stood up. 
That, that we cannot combat that. We do not have the ability to protect ourselves. And what that has bought us is we are using numbers that we have um, accumulated from the Department of Agriculture, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, the U.S. Censors, the California Abstract. We know that in the counties that we're looking at, we have lost 72% of our economy from 1994. 72% of all of the jobs and what we used to produce are gone. And we have no way to put a stop to it. We have no way to protect ourselves. Now we, we're hearing stories that, um, in the city of Reading that the California State Department of Justice is going around door knocking registered gun owners demanding to see their weapons. We have no ability to stop that. We have no representation. And the people that we have are doing their best. Now the biggest obstacles that we run into with people is they tell us two things. First off, we can't afford to do this. Well, number one, the state of California is $425 billion in debt. They have another $800 billion of unfunded liability. And what unfunded liability means is the bill's due, it's just not in the mailbox yet. What that accumulates to is each of my children are $29,000 in debt, and two of them aren't even out of diapers yet. And we have no ability to defend ourselves from that. Now this comes down to Reynolds versus Sims, okay? And I'm gonna get into that in a second. But getting back to why people say we can't afford to do this, how can we afford not to do it? We're going down the tubes, people, and we have to be able to save ourselves. Now, there's another thing floating around called the Six States Initiative, and that actually did us a favor because it forced the state of California to crunch some numbers. And the state of California came to the same conclusion that we've been preaching the whole time, we can sustain ourselves. The LAO report, that's the Legislative Analyst's Office, stated that we could be self-supporting, and that's running everything the way that California is now, which we have no intention of doing. We don't need 500 plus agencies, we don't need 300,000 plus state employees to manage what would be the state of Jefferson. Then, as a state, we have the ability to defend ourselves from the federal government, get back into our forests. Mark Baird's gonna dive into a lot of that and explain it. But the reason that we are where we are now is because of 1964, Reynolds versus Sims passed one man, one vote. Basically, that, what that did is destroyed the federal model of government that we had in our state house. What we originally had is we had one senator from each of our counties. There's a couple of the smaller counties that were lumped under one but we had a senator to represent each of our counties in the state house and the system worked because it was on the federal model. Reynolds versus Sims gutted that and turned both of our state houses into population based. It's why we're dominated by Southern California <clears throat> because both houses are weighted by population. We have to overturn Reynolds versus Sims and that's what we intend to do. If they will not give us our own state, we are going after Reynolds versus Stim, Sims, and we will restore our representation. We will get the 18 senators that we're missing and the 68 assemblymen that we're missing and vote ourselves out anyways. <laughs> and we know that we can win on Reynolds versus Sims. It's been done. There's precedent already set in the Supreme Court for that case to be won. Most of all in Wyoming where they actually went back to one senator per county. So we know we can win. Now the second thing that we get told is that this is too hard. Since when is anything too hard for Americans? Ever. The word impossible is not a statement of fact for us, it's a dare. We, our ancestors, have fought tooth and nail for this country for 250 years. Some of the things that they've gone through, look at the things that they've gone through. The Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Great Depression, World War II, World War I, Korea, Vietnam, and you're gonna tell me that it's too hard to make our representatives listen to us? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. You know what's interesting here is that uh, we had a question at one of our uh, town halls not too long ago, and a, a, a woman asked, well, where's the youth? So we now call Kayla Granny Brown. <laughs> the thing is, is that when we look at the youth and how they're energized about this, it's amazing to see it. How many youth do we have now on the website? Is it 25,000? Gave up counting at 26,000. The very first town hall we did was in Wairika. 
There was around 400 people. Mark Baird was on the back end of the speaking. Sheriff Lopi was on the front end of the speaking. And the five people in between were 25 years of age and younger. We're finding that the youth gravitate to this because they understand what's going on. And I want to give you a couple of statistics very quickly. Because when we're going to give you facts and figures, we're going to back them up with where we got them from, just as Robert just did. First of all, I um, had a conversation with Jim Nielsen, as I told you about. We had talked about the debt. I was on my way to a town hall in Oroville, and I had asked him, when you came here two years ago, and you were at a Tea Party meeting in Redding, California, with about 300 people, you were concerned that the debt was around $90 billion to somewhere in the neighborhood of $115 billion. Is that correct? He said, yeah, Terry, that's right. I said, OK. So what do you think it is today? Now, this was October the 22nd, 2013. Okay. He said, well, I'm not really sure. Well, what do you think? He said, maybe 200, maybe 200 billion. I said, no, as of today, as of this morning, October the 22nd, 2013, at 10.33 a.m., it was 418 billion, 793 million, 982 thousand, 147 dollars. I'm going to fast forward three months later, and Doug LaMalfo is speaking in Reading at another Tea Party event. It was a potluck, and it was a, an interesting time, just people talking and chatting, about 150 people, and he took a question and answer period. I asked him a question about unfunded liabilities. We've all heard of that, haven't we? I asked him a simple question. I said, on Sean Hannity's program last week, Paul Ryan was on, I normally don't watch it, but my father-in-law had it on, and I walked by. And Sean Hannity was complaining about the fact that we now have a $17 trillion debt, right, folks? Paul Ryan, with a very sober look, said, that's not the real problem. The problem is we have a $90 trillion debt in unfunded liability. Now, I asked Doug LaMalfa, then, is it fair to say that in the scope of the landmass of the state of California and the economy, is it fair to say that we could have a trillion dollars of unfunded liability? He said, not only is that fair to say, but it's probably low. Since that time, we have found out that they will admit to $895 billion in unfunded liability. If we add that to a debt of $420 plus billion dollars, we come up with about a trillion three, folks. A trillion three. Wouldn't you say that's unsustainable? Yeah. Wouldn't you? Yeah. The real deal is, is it isn't so much of how the state of Jefferson can sustain itself. The real deal is California can't. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Baird. Thanks, everybody, for having me here to speak. We're, we're here today to ask you to do something. We're here to ask you today to do something historic. We, need, we not only need you to vote yes on Measure A, but we need you to do more. We need you to ask everybody you know to vote yes on Measure A, and we need you to ask everybody they know to vote yes on Measure A, and we need you to ask everybody that's asked everybody to ask everybody that they know to vote yes on Measure A. And the reason we need that is because in 1992, you voted overwhelmingly to separate from the state of California. And here's what we need. We need a big number, and we need it from Tehama County. You're, you are the leader in the vote. You're the, the front runner at the ballot box. The reason we're at the ballot box here is because the supervisors wanted the voice of the people before they voted to affirm the declaration to withdraw. You are the people. I had a, I had a meeting with a supervisor in Shasta County. And he was getting pretty frustrated. We were sitting there at Denny's, and after about the 50th cup of coffee, he was starting to run out of questions. And, and he finally, his face was getting a little red because he's, you know, he's not a bad guy, but he can't see his way clear. He can't see his way out of this. He can't see the future the way we're going and he can't see that the state of Jefferson is possible. So he finally, just out of pure frustration, he, he even shook his finger and he says, what gives you the right? What, what gives you the jurisdiction? What, what are you doing sitting in front of me talking about this? Who, who, what's the deal here? 
And I said, well, Supervisor, that's the easiest question you've asked me all day. What gives me the jurisdiction? Three words. We the people. Yeah. We the people, in order to create a more perfect union, and you know the rest of that from grade school or junior high school, we the people created the government. We created the government. I built my own house. Is there anything stopping me from taking a bulldozer and knocking that thing down? My wife and I built it ourselves. I mean, I could knock that down tomorrow and build a chicken coop or an outhouse. No. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't ask for a grading permit. I'd get my bulldozer and do the deal, and then I'd ask forgiveness later. But, but the way that works is the people created the government. The people created the government. So now is the creation more important than the creator? We were created. Are we more important than our creator? No. So the people created government. The states created the federal government. The states were here before the federal government. We had 10 presidents of the Confederation before the United States Constitution was signed. The states elected those presidents. When the government fails to serve the people, it is their duty and their responsibility to abolish that government and institute a form of government more favorable to their happiness, their safety, and their security. When the Articles of Confederation failed to serve the states, they abolished that form of government and they formed the Constitution of the United States. Once again, they created the United the states created the United States of America. Is the creation now more important than the creator? I say to you that's not the case. And we, the people, have the jurisdiction to change that. And before I go on, I'd like to say something just for a second about liberty. I'd like to tell you a story about an American hero. This guy, Colonel, uh, Colonel Francis uh, Smith, was asked to lead his brigade, about 700 guys, and they were told to go out and destroy an enemy supply dump and capture and kill the, the defenders of that dump and their leaders if possible. So Colonel Smith leaves with his brigade, and he's marching, and it was quite a long march. And as usual, it was an insurgent situation. And so the insurgents knew more about what Smith was going to do, probably, than, than he did. In fact, they captured one of the insurgent spies along the way, and he, he more or less spilled the beans on the whole deal. So when Major Pitt Karen arrived at the first village with the advance units of this uh, force to destroy the enemy supply dump, he met our hero. Our hero's name was Captain John Parker. And he stood at the head of 70 men. And they faced 700 of the most powerful, well-trained soldiers on the planet. And they didn't run. Liberty. When Smith got back to Boston with the remainder of his force, he reported to General Gage that they'd won a great victory. And Gage said, with very many victory, we can't afford very many more victories like that because the American Minutemen killed about 250 of them on their way back to Boston. Liberty. Liberty has a, a way of finding the top. Liberty has a way of bubbling out. Liberty has a way of succeeding. I, I'm an airplane pilot. I've served in one war in the military and flown as a military contractor in six wars for the United States government. I've been to every crap hole on the planet. I'm here to tell you that liberty will find its way even if it's in violence. And we have the opportunity, we have a narrow window of opportunity to do something about our liberty. To do something. Not to talk about it. Not to go to a meeting and go have a sandwich. Not to go to a meeting and turn on the TV. But to do something. And that's what we're here to ask you to do today. What do we want to do? We want to form the first Article 4, Section 3 state split in 150 years. Article 4, Section 3 of the United States Constitution is very clear, it's very plain, it's pretty simple, not easy, but the language is simple. Nor shall any state be formed from the territory contained within another state or two adjoining states unless the state legislature agrees and Congress agrees. That's it in a nutshell. We need a simple majority, 51%. The governor's name is not mentioned in Article 4, Section 3, and neither is the president. From our reading of the Constitution, our legal advice, we need a simple majority in, in California and a simple majority in Congress. Now, that's not easy, 
but it is achievable. We have a narrow window of opportunity and the state of California keeps feeding us the ammunition with reckless abandon. So what we aim to do is split this state. The way we intend to do it is by gaining declarations from as many counties as want to be involved. And mind you, we're not going to counties and say you must live the way we tell you to, that's ridiculous. You, you guys have your own mind, you have liberty in your hearts just as well as we do. We're here to ask you whether or not you trust Sacramento, whether or not you want to continue doing business the same way California has been run for the last 50 years. This economic engine has been on the same track for 50 years, and it's a failure. It's an unimaginable morass of failed social engineering and economic projects until finally our rear end is an inch off the ground and the bucket is dry. I mean, I'm a rancher, and I'm here to tell you, I've got a $7,000 tractor that I'm expected to put a $20,000 exhaust filter on. I volunteer to be a criminal because I'm not doing it. Fish and, game, fish and game came to our ranch with the ITP, the incidental take permit, 25,000 bucks per ranch. Oh, and we get control over your property and we get to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. And we told them to pound sand. We told them if you want the water, bring your gun. And guess what they did? They went away. And we went, we went for two or three years after that, and every April 1st, which is the beginning of irrigation season on our adjudication, we invited Fish and Game to come and arrest me if they thought they could, and then 200 of my best friends would go with me and turn on the head gate. And guess what? They never showed up. They never did, because they're afraid of the people. They're afraid. They should be afraid, because we are the people mentioned in the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. We know that California is ungovernable. Uh, 570 state agencies, uh, we have all of these regulatory and social engineering projects and they are governed, they are intended to make your lives more difficult and more expensive. CARB, cap and trade. Where, where did the first $200 million of cap and trade go? It went in the general fund. Where did the fire tax go? The fire tax is kind of funny. A lot of journalists say, oh, they're just mad about the fire tax. But you know what that is? It's indicative of our situation because the fire tax was largely passed by urban legislators whose constituents don't pay the tax. I mean, my sisters live in Los Angeles. They don't pay that tax. They have a fire department. You pay the tax. But their legislators passed that bill. And my neighbor's a Cal Fire guy. Whenever he walks by me on the road, he always goes like this. But, you know, I'm not mad at him. You know, he's, he just has a job. But what he tells me is Cal Fire's not getting the money. A lot of the money's going into the general fund. So they violated Proposition 26 and they voted in a tax with a simple majority when it should have been two thirds. That's a lie, it's government malfeasance, it's Sacramento at work. And it is our representatives screaming in the hurricane to stop this stuff and they are powerless to do it because you are irrelevant. Your votes are irrelevant, they are irrelevant. Politics in Northern California is irrelevant. We lack the authority, we lack the political will, and we lack the strength to do anything we need to govern our lives properly. And that's what the state of Jefferson can stop. Now, an Article 4, Section 3 state split is moral, it's legal, it's ethical, and it's been done before. So we have precedent on our side. This is not something that somebody cooked up. Maine was a part of Massachusetts, Vermont was a part of New York, uh, Tennessee, I believe it was, and West Virginia were a part of Virginia. Yes, those circumstances were different, but yet it was done. The, the uh, last, I think, real Article 4, Section 3 state split was Maine from Massachusetts in the 1850 Compromise. It was done strictly according to Article 4, Section 3. That is proof that there's legal precedence for what we want to do. Now, what we need to do is we need to send a message that we need leaders, not politicians. We need leadership, not politicians. I, I love this statement. Dave Bryant from Sutter County came up with this, but I'm going to steal this and I'm not even going to be ashamed of it because it's so cool. I don't care if you're left wing or right wing. What we're trying to avoid is being part of the chicken. <laughs> now, Mind you, there, we have, there's no anger in this. We're not angry at people from Southern California. They're good people. They work, they live, they have kids, they, they raise their kids the way they think they should be raised. 
the problem is they don't know you. They don't know how you live. They don't know what it takes to be a rancher. They don't know what it takes to be a farmer. They don't know what it takes to live your lives, and they don't care. And why should they? They have lives of their own to lead. But their politicians are largely in charge of our lives, and that's the problem. And they have no empathy for how hard it is to live your life. I, my place, I, I run about eight, 900 acres, and I've got three or 400 acres of timber. Their timber is wealth. What they fail to realize is that the resources in Tehama County, the resources in Siskiyou County, and most of the rural counties, when you see a load of logs go by, a load of hay go by, a truck full of rice go by, corn, all of those things, that is real wealth. That's real money created off the sweat of somebody's back and what he knows how to do. It's not a stock scam or a CDS or a credit default swap or any of that stuff. That's the kind of money that we will use to, to create and have the state of Jefferson prosper is responsible use of our resources, which we would be free to do under a regulatory and business climate that favors industry and favors enterprise and favors the use of private property. Be all, all of our rights are common law rights. In other words, the right to property is a common law right. It's not a statutory right. It is your property. Your life is your property. The defense of your life is your property. The place that you own is your property. The things that you create, that you make, that you sell, those are property. And by the way, we don't have constitutional rights. We don't have those at all. We have inalienable rights that were given us by our creator, and we are not more important than our creator. Those rights are not ours to change, to give away. They can't be taken from us. You can fail to exercise them, but they cannot be taken from you unless you allow it. And those inalienable rights are all based on property. Life, liberty, property. Those are all common law rights that are guaranteed you in the Constitution. The Constitution is not the rules. That's not the rule book. It's not the owner's manual. The Constitution represents the line that the United States government is never supposed to cross. Yeah. 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 In the state of Jefferson, we will have a state constitutional framework that protects property and the individual's right to use that property to make a living for his family, and it will acknowledge our cultural, our historical, historic, and our moral link to one another. We have similar economies, we think similarly, we act similarly, and we need a state that reflects those things. And when we have our own state framework, we can use the Tenth Amendment to hold the feds at arm length, and we can demand the federal government follow all of its own rules prior to doing business in our state. Now, we've found that that makes them go away about 90% of the time because they don't even know what their own rules are. And I, I, that sounds funny, but it's true, like coordination. You ask them to coordinate, they say, well, we cooperate, and we say, no, we want you to coordinate. Well, we try to cooperate. We say, well, no, coordinate. Well, for example, we have, we have a TMDL going on in the Shasta River and the Scott River right now where the North Coast Water Board, who holds their meetings in Santa Rosa, and they determine the fate of the Scott River. Now, there's something in the Declaration of Independence about having meetings so far away from the seat of the people. Well, they do that routinely in California. So what they want is they want a river with absolutely nothing in it but water. Well, fish die in distilled water. They have to have something to eat. So, so we're fighting that, and we asked them, well, what's your, who is your data quality assessment officer? Because that's, that's required by the Data Quality Act and the Regulatory Flexibility Act of the United States government. They looked at each other and said, well, what's that? And we said, well, that's the guy who guarantees that your science is not fraudulent. Uh, we'll have to get back to you on that one. And then we asked him about the Regulatory Flexibility Act where you have to look at the economic devastation that your plan is going to rot on, on the local people prior to implementing that plan. Uh, we'll have to get back to you on that too. Well, they went away and that was two years ago. But, but they're not going to stay gone. We need our own state. I mean, we have bluffed them out of a few things, but it's not going to work forever. We need a more permanent structure where we can hold out our hand using the Constitution of the United States and the Tenth Amendment and hold the feds at arm's length. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you.
Also, once, once we accomplish a state that has the constitutional framework that protects the people and protects the individual's rights and, and their liberties, we then can create a state where the county has the lion's share of the power. That's what we imagine happening. There was a guy, thank you, there was a guy from France who came here and he studied the United States government after the second French Revolution and they were, they were really perplexed because the democracy in France didn't work. It was corrupt and people were dying. And so they sent Count Montesquieu to the United States and the first thing he discovered was that the township he called it, or the modern county, was the greatest form of government ever devised by man. Because when my representative, Marcia Armstrong, when she does something I don't like, I corner her in Walmart and I give it to her, you know. <laughs> and she knows. I mean, she'll try to hide and go down the other aisle and we're like this, but eventually she stands there and she takes it and she explains her decision and it's either good enough or it's not because I'm free to vote at the next election. So that's the, that is the state government we imagine, where the county has the lion's share of the power and the people of Tehama County instruct their representatives as to how they want them to behave in their government. And so you now have a state that has the backbone to stand up for the county's right to demand good behavior by the federal government, good behavior by all the agencies of the state, and the state government by statute will be required to uphold those wishes. So your county will be in charge of your government, and the state will do what states do best, which is liaise with the feds, administer whatever money the feds want to blow in your state, and talk to foreign governments and talk to other states, and otherwise keep their nose out of your business unless you ask them to come in. The regulatory framework of California has destroyed the economy. We lost 30,000 jobs, or 31,000 jobs last month, and Texas gained 30,000. Why? Because they have a tax framework that, that is friendly to business. They have a regulatory framework that doesn't make it a horrible, unimaginable nightmare to start a small business. I'm a small business person, and, I, and quite frankly, I'm almost to the point that I don't want the money that bad, not that there's much money in it, because the paperwork alone is enough to drown a normal man, and you spend five days a week trying to comply and trying to get along. There are other aspects of the state that will serve us. We can use the Enabling Act and the Equal Footing Act, and Utah is making a real try at this, and we're watching them very carefully to see how they do, but there is precedent for us to regain control of federally owned land and put... and to put that land back to beneficial use, put it back on the tax rolls, in other words. Now, we can either sell it or we can lease it out for grazing or farming or uh, hunting clubs or duck clubs or whatever the county of Tehama wishes to do with their portion of that land. And the same with the county of Siskiyou. But that's a way, for example, Fish and Game owns something like 760 properties in the state of California that are not on the tax rolls. They're supposed to be paying a thing called payment in lieu of taxes. Well, they haven't paid that in 10 years. And what do they say when you ask them for the, when a county asks them for the money? Well, the legislature took that line out of our budget and we're barred by law from paying things that aren't in our budget. And the legislature says, no, no, they can pay that money. And they're saying, no, we can't, because they said we couldn't. But the result of that is some counties are, have a million dollar debt from fish and game. Now, what would they do if you didn't pay your taxes for 10 years? <laughs> they would grab that property and sell it. And that's what the state of Jefferson would do to federal agencies that don't pay their PILT. We'd take that land and sell it. What, what we imagine is a state with a part-time legislature. They'll work six weeks a year. In odd years, they work on legislative matters. and even years, they work on the budget. Every legislator gets one bill. Make it a good one, because if that one fails, you don't get another one. Each county will have a state senator. Uh, assembly people will be elected by population because urban areas de deserve one man, one vote. And, and now Robert mentioned Sims versus Reynolds. That was a basket of cases in 1964 by a very, very liberal Warren court, Chief Justice Earl Warren, and he used a principle called the living document. And that was a very, that was a very a common argument in those days. Well, the Constitution really doesn't mean what it says. It's a living document, and we must change it with the times because we're more modern than those people were, and we know more. Yeah, I, my sentiment exactly, thank you. 
So, so he used that argument to create a principle called one man, one vote that is not contained in any text in the Constitution and is not found in the history of either Old England or the English colonies in America or the American colonies under the Confederation nor the United States of America. What's my proof of that? Two things, the Electoral College. How is the president elected? It's not, he's not elected by one man, one vote. He's elected by people who are appointed by the people to represent us to elect him. And the other is the Con Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. Every state has two senators. Vermont has two and Alaska has two. California, the most populous state in the union, has two. And Wyoming, the least populous state in the United States, has two. So why is it that Justin, Justice Warren created this principle where each man was guaranteed by the 14th Amendment one man, one vote? Well, he did it because, and, and this was funny, because later he was asked what achievement he was most proud of in all the years, all his tenure as Chief Justice. He did not say desegregation. He did not say uh, civil rights. He said he was most proud of the fact that he forced 30 state legislatures to change the way they elected state officers. In other words, he took away representation by county and he replaced it with an assembly that's a rubber stamp for the Senate because they're elected in the same way along the same boundaries by the same people. Now the problem with that was, was, was many fold for us. First of all, in 1965, Cal or 1964, California worked. Why? Because from 1926 until 1964, we had one state senator for each county. Our debt was around $5 billion. It ran a little up and a little down, but it was average about $5 billion. Well, by 1987, our debt was 13% of our GDP, and now it's in excess of 20% of our gross domestic product. And that's just the debt California admits to, not the trillion that Terry was talking about. Now, when we get our own state, we will be responsible for part of that debt. I'm sorry, that's the way it works. In, a, in order to be a moral people with a morally upheld constitution, we have to accept responsibility for monies that were spent. No, you didn't get to vote on it, but you weren't asleep while it was happening. That's just the way it works. So what we need to do is get away now because the state only admits to 140 billion. And the state's attorney general said that as as we are only 3% of the population of California in the state of Jefferson, we would most fairly be apportioned 3% of the debt. 3% of 140 billion, we, we could handle that. It would be tough for a while, but we can handle it. Could we handle 3% of a trillion? What if we wait 10 years? 3% of 5 trillion, 10 trillion, who knows where this is gonna go? Because it's going up at $5,000 a minute, not down. If Jerry Brown is correct, the California debt clock should be stopped, right? It should be level. If we have the balanced budget and we, don't, we have a surplus and all the stuff he says, why is the California debt clock ticking up faster than you can see the numbers move? Because the governor's a liar. <laughs> So we envision a state where the enabling acts and the equal footing acts will help us place property that's not in our control in beneficial use and back on the tax rolls. We envision a state that does not have a state roads department. We don't need one. Every county has a road department. Caltrans is largely funded by the federal government. We just divvy that money up to the counties and they can use that as they see fit. And when they have projects that are too big for them and they need some advice or some technical expertise or some money, they go to the state engineer's office that has five people in it instead of 50,000 and they ask for advice. The state engineer goes to the feds and he talks them out of a little loot just like California does and all the other states do. In other words, within five years our economy would flourish. Can we afford a California style bureaucracy? No. But we don't need one. We don't want one. We want smaller government where we get back to the basics of good government, where you determine what your children learn at school, not common core. Yeah. So after Reynolds versus Sims, Warren went on, or excuse me, it started actually with Baker versus Carr, and the dissenting justice said, once we jump into the thorny thicket of political redistricting, 
we, we're, we are in the argument now. Well, Justice Warren ignored that, and he went on with, um, I think it's Gray versus Sanders, where he decided that each man in the United States or woman will have one vote, and that's because of the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. Well, the Equal Protection Clause, Section 1, doesn't say anything about voting. The Equal Protection Clause, if you look at the history, was specifically designed after the Civil War so that black men and women would not be held accountable for crimes for which white people would not be held accountable, so that people of color would not be punished in a way that white people would not be punished. That was clearly the intent of Section 1. Section 2 mentions the vote, but it only says everyone has a right to vote no matter what their race, creed, or color. And there are several other amendments that address vote by women, uh, voting age lowered to 18 years, but uh, the 14th Amendment really has nothing to do with one man, one vote. For example, California didn't ratify the 14th Amendment until 1959. And we had a state senator for each county before the 14th Amendment, and we had a state senator for each county after the 14th Amendment. And then, as Robert said, Warren went on to, the court went on to ignore Warren's advice again in Wyoming in uh, Baker versus Thompson, where they said Niobra County, which was a very sparsely populated county, and even though Warren said votes don't represent acres, they represent people, in Niobra County, he said every county has the right to representation no matter how small it is. Uh, it's funny how that works, so he ignored himself. And then in Sailor versus Tulare Water, he, they said again that votes could represent rocks and trees provided the greater political interest was served and it wasn't done prejudicially. So we have an issue here where, as Robert says, if we fail, if we gain enough declarations to form a viable state, we go to Sacramento and we're ignored, Plan B, and you have a flow chart that was out on the table, plan B is to attack Reynolds versus Sims. This is not a one horse carriage. If we're ignored, and let's face it, it's, it's very possible that they'll try that first, then we will attack Reynolds versus Sims, and there are some pretty good constitutional lawyers that think that was bad law, and it's time for that law to re be revisited. And then as Robert said, with 40 rural counties, we just vote ourselves out of California. But our implied threat to the rest of California is, if you allow us to separate peacefully, we will not yank the rug out from under the one party system that California has right now, and you can continue to do business as usual, and we will go our way. Now, this has to be a win-win. How is it a win for Southern California? They would, they would free themselves of most of their political opposition. They would be free to take care of the problems that they have, and those problems are immense. I mean, gangs, infrastructure, earthquakes, stuff like stuff we can't even understand, and we don't help them with. And we would be free to form a constitutional framework that protects the individual with a friendly environment for business and a regulatory environment that allows you to farm and make a living and allows your children to grow up and stay here. And we know we would win. And so that's what we propose for the state of Jefferson. Now, I'd, I'd just like to close. I'm kinda, I kind of took it upon myself to write a preamble to our Constitution. And once again, the, these aren't things that the king is proclaiming. We're going to have a state constitutional convention. And even though we're writing a state constitution, that's just a, a place of beginning. And when we have the state constitution where Tehama County will be appropriately represented, the people will be free to rip that apart and rebuild it any way they choose and any way they see fit. But we have to have something to begin with. So what I'm doing is I'm reading all 50 state constitutions and I'm picking the best stuff out of each one. And that will be the start. And then with our state constitutional convention, the people will rebuild that constitution in, into something that they, they choose to live with. Also. Once we have our state constitution and committees of separation are formed, then the debt will be apportioned and the stuff will be apportioned, like the Caltrans bulldozer parked in Red Bluff. Who gets that? Who gets the police cars that are left over when the highway patrol departs the area? Things, things like that. Those are, those are the million mundane details that will have to be taken care of. That's going to be the hard work. Is it going to be difficult? Yes. Can we do it? Absolutely. Do we need to? You betcha. So this is the preamble to the Constitution of the State of Jefferson. There are times in the history of men when political discourse leads to a separation of two people. 
We, the people of the state of Jefferson, do not make this separation out of enmity, for in the case of enmity, we hold none toward any man, woman, race, or creed. We make this separation in the name of representation, the last barrier standing between the people and tyranny. Tyranny, however well-intentioned, is nonetheless repugnant. Our safety, our security concern us not where liberty is at risk. Liberty gives urgent voice to our demand for representation, representation which must reflect our needs, our history, our culture, and our moral imperative. It is these liberties the people of Jefferson hold most dear. It is our natural and alienable rights which compel us to establish the state of Jefferson. We, the people, direct our representatives now and forever that the intent and meaning of this Constitution shall always be adjudicated to the protection of lives, liberty, and property of and for the people of the state of Jefferson. With this state Constitution, it is our humble prayer to Almighty God to purchase liberty for our posterity. You're here. One last thing, and I'll let you up. Um, Patrick Henry said something that was, that was really important to what's going on today. As the Revolutionary War was approaching, he stood in front of a body of men, and he said, why do we stand here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? In other words, if we get a new country, what do you want? What, what would gentlemen have, he said. What, what's the American dream? Is it life, liberty, property? Is it a roof over your head, a few bucks? Is it a good life for your children? Is it a place you can be safe in? What is it for you? What is the American dream? And that's what Patrick Henry was asking. And then he went on to say, is life so dear or peace so sweet to be purchased at the price of liberty? Forbid it, almighty God, forbid it. For I know not what course others may take. As for me, give me liberty or give me death. Thank you.